Let me tell you what I'm doing this year. Uh, this is not part of my message. Just let me prep you. Uh, just continue playing with me a minute, Don Davis, if you would. The word that the Lord gave me for this year, and I, I want you to be very attentive because I, I take this stuff seriously. This ain't a gig to me. I'm very passionate about what I do. I'm very passionate about you. The Lord told me, he said, I want you to pursue an open heaven. He didn't say this is the year of the open. He didn't say, he said, I want you to pursue an open heaven. And I'm going to be going through the word of God and doing series on the things that had to be in order for the heavens to open. That's why my first one is on praise and worship. I'm going to go ahead and tell you the praise and worship is about to shift hard. It's about to get wilder. Those of you that don't like it wild, bring you some cortisone cream, rub it on everything that itches, whatever you got to do. Bring you a Benadryl. It's about to get wilder. The intensity is about to go up. I've been working diligently on this stage with these musicians behind the scenes. Nobody knows to get the, there has to be the right things in place. There are protocols to opening up the heaven. Nobody pays attention to protocols anymore. Nobody. Everybody just gets in a room and tries to worship. Well, you can worship anytime you want to. But there's a protocol to getting to God. The high priest didn't go back and throw open the curtain to the holiest of holies and walk in. He'd be dead. You got to enter his gates with thanksgiving. You got to enter his courts with praise. A lot of people don't like to praise anymore because they're lazy. You can't, be, you can't praise and be lazy. Praise is active. I'm 55 and I'm not praising a lot of you 22 year olds in here. Come on, somebody. You're going to have to take it up a notch to roll with me. The things in place. The things in place economically. Like I just talked about to walk under an open heaven. I won't deal as long with that, but maybe two or three weeks later on in the year. I'm going to deal with that. The Bible says in Isaiah that there'll be a blessing and a covering of glory over every household. How to get your household to operate under an open heaven. I'm going to cover all of it this year how we get the pattern of things in place where we wake up every day under an open heaven. When the heavens open up, anything can happen. And that's the way I want you to live. When we get in this room, I want us to walk in this room under an open heaven. I'm telling you, our services are gonna get more and more unscripted. You need to go ahead and prepare for that. You need, to, you need to prepare for them to go off into ministry at any time. You need to prepare that God's healing somebody over here. He's casting out a demon over here. Seven people's getting saved over here. A marriage is being healed back here. And somebody's getting off drugs back there. And it's all going on at the same time and there ain't been no altar call. It's just because we're under an open hell. Can you see that? Can anybody see that with me? And churches have gotten to be experts at hosting people, but we've lost the art of hosting God. And we're welcoming you and we're patting you and we're giving you t-shirts and koozies and take this way and we're giving you signs and escorts and we're, but we don't know how to host God anymore. And I love you, but I'm not as excited about being with you if God ain't in the room. If I can be with you and be with God at the same time, that's a special day. So be ready in this upcoming year. I know at least six months of the first part of the year, I'm going to be really divulging these scriptures, studying, uh, getting in depth as to how these things go. I want to be a Bible teacher. I don't want to teach all this pop culture and all this mishmash. And I want you, I want this to be a moment away from politics and a moment away from what's going on and a moment away from the, I want this to be your, your, your breath of fresh air. I can't stand it when I go to church and they're talking about the same thing CNN and Fox is. Give me a break. Give me the word. I need the word of God. All that stuff can't help me. I need a word, pastor. So anyway, I got to quit. I'll start preaching on that. But, um. I want you to open your Bible, if you would, to Ephesians 1, your Bible app, your phone, however you get there, Ephesians 1. Guys, back in the back, listen closely and go with me. I know I gave you a lot of scriptures. I may skip around a little bit. I'm not sure. Uh, I think I've got it the way I want it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to move. I'm going to try to read every one of these scriptures if time will allow me to. 
Ephesians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every, say every, every. spiritual blessing. Where is it at? Which means it does you no good where? On earth. Faith is not creating things that does not exist. Faith is moving things from an invisible dimension to a visible dimension. Everything you need has already been provided for you in an invisible realm. Okay? Invisible realm. I, here again, I've got so many things I've taught you. I don't know when the last time I said what. I've been doing this a long time now. Invisible does not mean anything about the object. It has to do with the subject, you. It means that the thing is there, but your eyes do not have the ability to perceive the image. So there are things in a parent realm. This is the subject realm. So if you can see it, smell it, taste it, touch it, or feel it, it is subject to something you cannot see. When there's something that breaks open in the natural, that means there's been something going on in the spiritual long before it. Because once you see something in the natural, the spirit has then moved on to the next thing. Ooh, God Almighty. He's blessed you with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. This is really going to upset some of you, but I got to say it. That means you don't have any needs. I got to preach to the love and sometimes I just don't get no love. Let me go over here. You don't have any needs. I dare you to tell your neighbor, say, you don't have any needs. You don't have, you don't have any needs. So if there's any lack in our life, what have I not done? I've not successfully moved it. Because he's blessed me. He's not going to do any more than he's already done. Everything that needed to be accomplished has been accomplished when he said it is finished and went and sat down. Sitting down is a posture of completion. There's nothing else to be done. Next verse, please. Who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he chose us in him <laughs> before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You know what the good pleasure of his will means? He did it because he wanted to. Oh, that's a bad God right there. Father, bless your word and give me supernatural communication to teach it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. If you're visiting, we talk to each other at this church. Touch your neighbor on both sides. Say, here we go, neighbor, here we go. God sees you much differently than you see yourself. God sees you like this. I used to take Ephesians chapter 1 and 2 and preach a message about a picture. I don't know if you've ever heard it. I have no idea. It's been years ago. Where God has a picture and in Ephesians 1, he shows it to himself. In Ephesians 2, he shows it to you. The latter part of Ephesians 2, he shows it to the world. But then Ephesians 3, it says that he shows it to the devil. There are steps by which the picture of your life are moving through. But you got to understand when God sees you, God does not see you in stages. God sees your life as a completed picture, a canvas where all of the artistry has been painted and all of the strokes of the artist have been finished. That's the way God sees your life. I always teach you that God does not know a yesterday, a today, and tomorrow. God is forever in a state of I am. So you got to understand God always lives in now. That's why the Bible says he, Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, all faith is immediate. I'm not believing for tomorrow. I'm not believing for yesterday. Right now, Jesus came back to Mary when Lazarus was dead. She said, if you would have been here, you could have healed him. And just one what she's talking about. She's talking about then faith. And then she moved to, I know he'll be resurrected at the end of the age when everybody, she went to tomorrow faith. Jesus looked at her and said, I am the resurrection and I am the life right now. In other words, I didn't have to do it then. I don't have to wait till tomorrow because I am is standing right here in front of you. 
God is present in your immediate moment, in your immediate need. So God got together in heaven and painted a picture for your life. He knows it from the end to the beginning, from the beginning to the end. He sees the whole picture of your life and all of your steps have been ordered by the Lord. He predestined you. Come on, somebody. He predestined you. Romans chapter 8 says, those he, pre, uh, those he foreknew, he did predestine. So in heaven, God got together and he knew you. He was intimately acquainted with you. And then he predestined. He preed your destiny. Pre means before. Destiny means in. God went to your end first and he preed it. So God in heaven already had your steps ordered, your end decided, and has a journey that you are to walk through when you enter this life. And when did he do it? He did it in heaven. He blessed you with every spiritual blessing, and he did it in accordance with the pleasure of his will. In other words, he made a picture, showed the picture to himself, and said, it is good. I like what I'm doing with their life. Can anybody say amen about that? Okay, so he's, he's looked at your picture. He sees you much differently than you see yourself. God sees the end of things. And God calls you by the end of things. I can take you from Genesis all the way to the end of the book. And God walks up to somebody and he, Jesus walks up to somebody excuse me, and immediately changes their name. They say you're Simon, but I call you Peter. Simon means read. Whichever way the wind blows. Who them people make me nervous? Them people that become whatever environment they're in, they make me nervous. That was, that was Simon. He said, but I declare you are Petra. Peter, rock. You're not this person that becomes whatever people want you to become. You're actually steadfast and immovable. He walked right, he ain't had one Bible lesson. He hadn't seen a miracle. He hadn't shared a meal with Jesus. And Jesus walks right up to him and calls him by his end. God goes up to Jacob. The word Jacob, his name means trick. What did he do? He tricked his brother out of his birthright. Amen. I probably should have never named Chase, Chase. Lord have mercy from the womb, we chased him, amen. <laughs> but many times in the Bible, you were named after your character. And so Jacob, that was his character. His character was he was a trickster, a deceiver, a supplanter. And G God came up to him and said, thou art Israel, a prince. Man, let me tell you something, there's a long way between trick and prince. And God knows the distance between the two. And he's ordered the steps for you to end up there. When God shows himself the picture, he shows himself a picture of a completed you, a perfected you, a you in everything that he saw that you could be, okay? That's not the hard part. God has no problem believing in you. It's the next part. And out of all four areas, this is where I'm gonna bear down a little bit. Ephesians 1, 16 through 23. Ephesians 1, 16 through 23, here we go. I do not cease to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers. Next verse. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. I want you to say this with me today. I'm doing a heavy teaching. Say spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That the eyes of your understanding be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of your calling. Oh, I wish I had time. There's so much here. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance? Next verse, please. In the saints. Let's go all the way through to verse 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Who lives like this? This is crazy which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. Verse 21, let's read it all. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not in this age, but in the age which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Last verse right here. 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I told you I was going to unload a lot of scripture on you. Are you ready? I wasn't going to unpack this. Let me unpack it. God sees the picture of you. Are we in a hurry? Are we all right? Okay. God sees the picture of you. Now the picture has got to leave heaven and it's got to enter the earth. Romans chapter eight tells this process. To those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. Predestination and being known happens in heaven. Now it's moving into the earth. That's called a calling. The calling is when God begins to show you snapshots of what he did in heaven. Just snapshots. Had no idea I would be spending my life doing what I'm doing. But can look back in the days when I did not serve God and see snapshots of how I cared for people. Snapshots of how I was a defender of the weak. Snapshots of how I wanted diversity in every one of my settings. Snapshots of multiculturalism. Snapshots of wanting to take somebody's life and elevate it and make it better. Snapshots of wanting to help somebody out that was weaker than myself. Had nothing to do with Jesus. I wasn't even saved, didn't even claim him, didn't even walk with him. And in some of the worst days of my life, snapshots of all these things taking place. Yet I didn't know it all was a part of a picture. And so God let me begin to see that there was a calling on my life. Do you know what I'm talking about? So in other words, heaven is calling me to do something in the earth. Stay with me. Now, he said, the reason that this calling never happens is not a spiritual problem, it's a comprehension problem. He says, I chose you, I chose you to have every spiritual blessing. Everything heaven has to offer, everything I can give you in my son, it is all a part of your plan in life. He went on to say, now, I pray that the Father give you the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in this knowledge and that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that you would know the hope of his calling. So in other words, it's not is there a plan, it's can you comprehend it? Because most people do not see themselves the way God sees them. I'm going to push this message all the way through that back curtain back there. Hallelujah. Can you see what he said? In other words, he said, he said, I'm praying that the blinders of your current situation, the blinders of the way you were raised, the blinders of your difficult economic surroundings, the blinders of what you didn't get, and the blinders of what you don't have. He said, I want all that to be taken off. And that the spirit, something that would come from within you, instead of you listening to every voice that surrounds you, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation and that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. What does that mean? Revelation means reveal. Veal means to uncover. Re means again. So God knows it, but he's got to open it up to you again because it's already in there. And it only comes by revelation. You will never know who you are because of what somebody told you. Who you are is a revelation. I had to come to a revelation of all the things in my life that I am to do and that I am to be. Yes, there are environments that can help me. Yes, there are people that can help me. Yes, there are teachings that can help me. But it's a revelation of who I am. And then when I see myself in Possum Kingdom, I need the eyes of my understanding enlighten that I may know what is the hope of my calling. Look, 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 look. What does it look like? Which he demonstrated in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Come on. You Your calling was demonstrated when God gave dead things life. Mm. God is all about resurrections. So he wants you to know that no matter what life, what, part, what season of life, you come into the knowledge of this plan and this God, that God is able to resurrect everything in you that has died up to that moment. Listen, and not just resurrected, 
but place it above all power, all dominion, all principality, and everything that is named, that all things will be under his feet. Come on, do you see what I'm talking about? So in other words, God wants you to be enlightened to the picture of your life. Let me break it down. He wants to, you know, to have the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation. He wants you to shut out the outside voices. He wants you to be, not worry about what your eyes see, but understand what your spirit is telling you. And then when he opens your eyes, he wants you to know that God has the power like he did with Jesus to resurrect every dead place in your life. And no matter where, how low it is now, to place it far above all might, all power, all dominion, all principality, and every name that is named, not just in heaven and on earth, but under the earth, and put all things under your feet. Excuse me. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen in this building. Am I breaking it down? Woo! Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. Now, <clears throat> Numbers 13. The Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the new. Right? When he's trying to reveal to Israel, this is who you really are. What have they been? They've been in bondage. They've been on Pharaoh's welfare program. And that's all they know. That's all they know. God got them off of that program in one day. And said, you're not going to live under that limitation anymore. And he walked out. They'd been in the desert. God's given them a moral code, the Ten Commandments. He's trying to show them who he is, what he can do, what he's like. They don't know their God. And now he gets to the place, he says, now, I want you to see the picture of who I intended you to be. Numbers 13. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains. Next verse. See what the land is like, whether people that dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land be is rich or poor, whether there are forests or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now, the time was the season for the first ripe grapes. Let's go on to the next one. Next one I gave you, number 13. They return. <laughs> Here we go. Next verse. Now they departed and came back, Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of the wilderness of Paran. Next verse. At Kadesh, they brought back the word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Next verse. Then they told him and said, we went to the land you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit, verse 28. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there, verse 29. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites that dwell in the Mount, the Canaanites, and all the ites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Next verse. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. God, give me about a hundred Joshua's and Caleb's and I'll take over the world. Okay. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. Next verse. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying the land through which we're given is the land that devours its inhabitants and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. I think the next verse is the last one. Therefore, there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants and we were like grasshoppers in our sight and so we were in their sight. Whew. Hmm. God sees you much differently than you see you. Now, they go into the land, Canaan. 
Canaan means promise. Okay? What did God bless you with? With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Promises. In the Old Testament, everything is physical and natural. In the New Testament, everything is spiritual. So this is a physical Israel that are going into their physical promise, the promised land. Everything, they have been blessed with everything in the promised land and it's all theirs, okay? But they went and peered into it. And when they did, they came back and out of 12, 10 gave a bad, rep bad report. The two that gave a good report were Joshua and Caleb. Say this right, say Joshua and Caleb. In fact, later on the Bible says that Caleb had an excellent spirit. I like that. Joshua and Caleb, what were the 10 that gave the bad report? Nobody cares because nobody remembers negative people. <laughs> Nowhere will you find those 10 listed because nobody cares about them. Because nobody wants to keep a list of all the naysayers in their life. The haters and the criticizers and the can't do this and can't do that. Nobody wants to keep a list of the people that kept you in the wilderness when you could have been eating the grapes of the promised land. Do you see what I'm talking about? So the problem is not how God sold them. The problem is how God is how they sold themselves. We were like grasshoppers in our sight and therefore we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Let me tell you something. The whole world will see you like you see you. Do you place any value on you? They won't either. Ladies, how fast can it go and how hard does it have to work? Can we just get real? I can't believe he said that. How you see you is how he sees you. Men, do you have no confidence and you can't move forward in your life? How you see you is how she sees you. It is quiet at redemption. <laughs> when you go in to negotiate, how you see you is how they see you. When you need the loan, how you see you is how they see you. When you're trying to sell your product, how you see your product is how they see your product. And they were seen as small because they saw themselves as small. Amen. Folks, all of life is are you going to look at giants or fruit? Mm. Let me go ahead and tell you who's got a few years in my rear view mirror. All of life. Marriage, are you going to look at the giants or the fruit? Okay. You want to start a business? There's a lot of giants. There's a lot of fruit. You want to go into ministry? Let's just move on from that one. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's all of life. You know what other people, whether you, you, you deciding whether or not to be their friend, it's giants and fruit. Giants and fruit. The, there's a story in the Bible and during the time of Elisha the prophet about Naaman the leper. I used to teach my pastors in my network. I said, every staff member, I said, is like Naaman. The Bible says he was a man of valor. He was a mighty man. He was a great leader. And by his hand, he had brought many victories to his king. He said, but he was a leper. Every person is victories versus leprosy. Which one's heavier? If your leprosy out, out, as, as outweighs what you bring to the table, I probably can't, I'm going to part ways with you. But if what you bring to the table outweighs your leprosy, we're going to make this work. Because I understand everybody brings both. Yeah, is, is it? 
Am I help? Is this? I can't get a foot. Somebody back in the back say amen. I need to hear a back. Okay. It's all of life. Even Jesus himself said the kingdom is like a treasure in a field. What is a field? Dirt. What is a treasure? Something that is valuable. He said all of life, every person, he said every relationship is a treasure in a field. And for the joy thereof, the man sold all he had and went and bought the whole field. You don't get just to buy the fruit. You don't, you don't get the fruit without the giant. You don't get the victories without the leprosy. Come on. And you don't get the treasure without the field. Nobody can just buy all the good stuff. Life, not, not, not just life. Jesus said the kingdom is not even like that. You go into the kingdom knowing you got to move dirt to get to treasures. You go into a relationship knowing they're going to bring negative things to the table, but hopefully the positive they bring to the table outweighs it. And when you go into new territory, you're going to see all the opportunity, but you're going to see all the opposition, and you get to choose. Here's the next thing. I'm stuck in number two. What is God doing? He's showing it to you. He showed it to himself. He's fine with it. Now he's showing it to you. Or do you have the grasshopper complex? The grasshopper complex is when you always see yourself inferior to your calling. You don't see yourself be... Listen, guys, I done got aggravated. We're going to turn this thing around today. Come on, we're going to turn this thing around. The grasshopper complex is going down in this room today. Stay with me, stay with me. I tell you what, if they don't shout, get up on top of them keys and make it scream a little bit. Can I break it down? I don't feel like being in a hurry, I'm gonna be honest with you. I'm full of word. I was even up late last night, God's still giving me stuff. <clears throat> Again this morning. I was drinking coffee, typing this morning, just stuff kept coming. New American Standard, 2 Timothy chapter 1, says to stir up the gift of God that is in you, that was given you by the laying on of hands. And then he said something, great. okay, stir up the gift. In other words, you've been given something to move your life. God said, I'll ignite the fire, but you're going to have to stoke the embers. Some of you don't know how to keep the fire going because you don't know how to stoke the fire. So you always need to come back to God and him reignite you. You got to go away here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and keep stoking them. That's why so many times we got to start praising worship at a one instead of an eight. If you worship it all week long, the thing would start at a whole different place. So I'm talking about start at a whole different place. I walked in the building jumping. I walked in the room speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. I got up this morning and I already was speaking in the Holy Ghost before my feet hit the floor on beside my bed. Why? Because I'm, it's, not a, it's not a church thing for me. It's not a gig for me. It's a lifestyle. So then he said, and he said, for God has not given us, actually the King James there is not true. It says the spirit of fear. It says the spirit of timidity. That is the more accurate translation. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love. And here again, it goes back to your mind, a sound mind that God would open, that God would give you the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of revelation, the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you would have a sound mind because you never get anywhere that you can't think first. Your thoughts will have to go there before your life goes there. Ah, help me, Jesus, help me. Let me tell you something, pity has a mindset. Confidence has a mindset. Winning has a mindset. Losing has a mindset. Poverty has a mindset. Wealth has a mindset. Singleness has a mindset. Marriage has a mindset. If you go into a marriage with a single mindset, your marriage won't last. 
God, do you see what I'm talking about? Everything has a mindset. In other words, my next level has a mindset. So I've got to learn to think on the next level while I'm on this level. I got to learn to talk on the next level while I'm on this level. Because everywhere you go has a mindset. Touch your neighbor and say, can you think it? Come on, can you think it? Can you think it? Hallelujah, I feel a move of the Spirit of God in this room. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. trying to wind this down. Oh my goodness. <laughs> For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. I just read Numbers 13. Do you know what that is? The spirit of timidity. What is timidity? Timid. The root word of in timid Asian. For God has not given us the spirit of intimidation. What is intimidation? Intimidation is not loss. Intimidation is not defeat. Intimidation is being so convinced you can't win that you never fight. Let me throw that one out again. Intimidation is not a loss. Intimidation is not a defeat. Intimidation is being so convinced you can't win, you never even engage in the first place. And they're standing there holding the grapes of the promised land in their hand. In their hand. Look, look at this fruit. Milk, honey, everywhere. Fortified cities. And Israel has seen God take down the greatest military machine on the planet, Pharaoh. Israel has seen water turn to blood. Israel has seen 10 plagues. Israel has seen them go out in the desert and eat three square meals a day. They've had manna on the ground and quail flying low. God opens up a rock and lets water come out of it so that a whole nation can drink. He warms them with a fire at night and he keeps them cool with a cloud at day. And now they're standing here and all of a sudden they're afraid of tall people. What is up with this? Oh, those people were big people. God took a wave and wiped out a nation. And all of a sudden we're scared of tall people. <laughs> they weren't scared of tall people. I feel the spirit of God. I'm going in and I'm taking somebody with me, whoever wants to go. Clap your hands if you want to go with me. I'm going in. Ooh, I feel this thing. <laughs> they, weren't fair, they weren't afraid of tall people. Listen to what they said. That land devours its inhabitants. You can't be a bunch of slaves and run that city. They weren't scared of tall people. They were scared of the promised land. Because to be in the promised land, you have to be a giant. And they said, we can't ever be giants. You got to be a giant to live in that land. And I don't think I can ever become what it takes to live in that land. It wasn't about the giants. It was about can I become what it takes to function like that. Yes. Folks, I am preaching.
If you'll sit down, I'll be through in five minutes or thereabouts. Listen to me, listen to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's always, can you think it? It's always, can you think it? I remember back in the late 90s, I was just glad to have a metal building that set 900 people and we filled it. I was so happy. You understand, I've never been in a church bigger than 200. So I was already living in a dream world. Already. And then a visiting prophet comes along, points to me and says, get ready for global ministry. Man, it took me two years to build this metal building. <laughs> global ministry. Then we go buy some used equipment from a new station for $26,000, about four generations old, and buy all the junk time on all the four o'clock in the morning stuff we can get. Now get ready for global ministry. And we on local TV at 4 a.m. with four generation old equipment. But the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation, my eyes begin to open up that what God had in that room. He wanted to sit in living rooms all over America. But you know what? It would have never happened if I couldn't think it first. The struggle was not with could God do it. The struggle was can Ron think it. You're going to look at giants and you're going to look at fruit and the choice is yours for which one you magnify. That choice is not God's, it is yours. Whatever gets your focus is what will control your destiny. And if all you can see is a giant, I hope you like the desert because you will remain there. But if that fruit tastes too good, you will, he will raise you far above all might and all dominion and all power and all principality and every name that is named and put all things under your feet. But can you see yourself like he sees you? But pastor, I'm struggling. Yeah, but God does not see you in struggle. So you can think like you're thinking or you can think like God. And those thoughts will pull you out of your struggle and take you to a different place. Can I just do something in mass right now? I'm not even gonna finish the message. I got two more, I'm not even gonna finish it. Right now in this room, you know there's greatness bound up in your heart, but you're having a hard time seeing yourself like that. I don't know where it came from. It may be the words of a stepfather. It may be the lack of a father at all. It may be deficiencies in your home. It may be the words of your last abusive relationship. I don't know where it came from. But if you are in this and you witness right now, I'm staring into my future, but I'm struggling with a grasshopper complex. Stand to your feet right now. We're gonna break this thing in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Ah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I wish some people just pray in the Holy Ghost all over this building. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I walk these aisles right now and I break it, I break, come on, put your hands on your head, put your hands on, I break that right now in the name of Jesus. 
I break that grasshopper complex in the name of Jesus. I break that grasshopper complex in the name of Jesus. I break it in the name of Jesus. Come on, break it. I break it in the name of Jesus. I break it. I pull it out of my mind. I pull it out of my head. I pull it out of my thoughts. I pull it out of my daily routine. I pull it out of my thinking. I pull it out of my dreams. I send a bokota. I pull it out. I pull it out. I pull it down like every other stronghold. I pull it down. I pull it down. I pull it down. And I have not been given the spirit of timidity. I come against it by the blood of Jesus. You spirit of timidity, the blood of Jesus is against you. And we break your hold off the people of God right now. Somebody begin to break it. Somebody begin to break it. The anointing destroys the yoke and removes the burden. Somebody begin to break it. Come on, take authority over it. Get mad at it. Get upset about it. And say, I'm tired of standing on the outside, being scared of giants. I break this thing in the name of Jesus. Come on, I'm giving you one minute to do it. Hey! 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 Break! 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 Let the anointing destroy every yoke and remove every burden. Let freedom come in the name of Jesus. I'm going to be honest with you, this ain't even a New Year service. I'm here on an assignment. I, I feel a sense of assignment today. That's why it's been so quiet in this room. Hopper complex, that's my name by the way. I gave it that name. Don't you go write no book on that. I'm gonna chase it out of this room. <laughs> there's there's promises all over this room, and you're mad because you think God hadn't got you there. No, you're looking at giants. Next time somebody sees greatness in you, don't give them the list of all why you can't. God wants you to live in this neighborhood and God wants you to own this house where I'm a single mom. I only have my income. <clears throat> Sometimes I have to work two jobs just to get it. No! Stop! God wants you to live in that neighborhood. Are you going to look at giants or are you going to look at fruit? Quit talking about giants. This is not a giant church. This is a fruit church. So many promised lands in this room waiting to be inhabited. We stand outside with a grasshopper complex and a case of the I can'ts. Because God shows himself your picture, then God shows you your picture, then he shows the world your picture. But then the Bible says, to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of darkness. that when you get in your promised land, God can take your life and put it in the devil's face and say, despite every roadblock, <laughs> despite every storm, despite every test, despite every sickness, despite every argument, despite every naysayer, despite every giant, they got to where I saw them in heaven and God is gonna take you there anyhow. Turn around and high five five people and say, God is gonna get you there anyhow, hallelujah.